Good afternoon, everyone. God bless you. God bless you. It is well with you in Jesus' name. It's good to have you back in class. Uh, if you can hear me, please let me know you can. If the audio is good, okay. God bless you. God bless you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we magnify your name this afternoon. We lift your name above all other names. You are worthy, you are faithful, you are good. You are the Lord and you never change. You are the El Shaddai, the Adonai, the Prince of Peace. In you, O oh Lord, there is no darkness. You are full of light. You are the ancient of days. We want to see you. Father, have your way. Today, O oh Lord, we pray for the spiritual gift of knowledge spiritual gift of understanding that everything we discuss here today we will have a better understanding in the name of Jesus Christ endow us with wisdom from heaven above feed us with manna from heaven help us to know what you want us to know and let this word equip us and prepare us for the assignment that you have for us oh God in the name of Jesus Christ Holy Spirit we invite you to be our teacher tonight so everything we say everything we do let it all bring glory and honor to your name thank you father in Jesus name we have prayed. Amen. Chapter 16. Last time I said probably we'll cover chapter 16 and 17 uh, today. But because of the program going on, we will only be able to cover chapter 16. So chapter 16, rhetorical criticism and the implied reader. Rhetorical criticism and the implied reader. Hmm. So, rhetorical criticism. For us to understand this, what is rhetoric? Rhetoric is strategic, purposeful, and persuasive written or verbal communication. Purpose of rhetoric is to persuade an audience through words. Now, when we are talking about rhetorical criticism, it is the analysis of the language used to persuade an audience. So rhetorical criticism inv involves an an analyzing the use of rhetoric. Hmm.
Mm. Let's look at some methods of rhetorical criticism. Number one, cluster rhetorical criticism. It is analyzing clusters of words by looking at how frequently the words appear or how intense the words are. The repetition of certain words can be used to persuade an audience, which is why examining frequently used words in rhetorical speech can help you understand how the author or speaker is persuading through words. Mm. Like when you say something over and over and over and over again, and it entered into people's subconscious mind, and they believe it. Not only they believe, they begin to react to it because you've said it over and over and over and over again. All right. The second one, ideological rhetorical criticism. It is analyzing the main idea that dominates the text. This kind of rhetorical criticism also looks at what ideas might be suppressed by the main idea and why. This type of criticism looks at how rhetorical strategies are used to persuade an audience and support the main idea. Mm. So let's look at the third one, metaphoric rhetorical criticism. It identifies metaphors. Comparis is not using like or as in a text or speech. Many metaphors are used to persuade audiences, which is why metaphoric rhetorical analysis identifies metaphors in rhetorical speech and looks at how these metaphors work to persuade. How do they work to persuade? Praise God. And we see that over and over and over in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark. All right. Let's look at narrative uh, rhetorical criticism. It involves analyzing the use of narratives to persuade audiences. Many speakers and authors utilize elements of character, plots, and setting to connect with audiences and persuade them. Amen? The next one is pentadic rhetorical criticism. This looks at the who, what, when, where, why, and how. I call them six honest men. Who, what, when, where, why, and how? It look at this. It look. It it looks at the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the speech or text. In other words, this type of criticism examines the agent, the act, sin, purpose, and agency. And this type of criticism is interested in the motivations behind the rhetoric and how those contribute to persuasiveness. How they contribute to persuasiveness. Praise God. All right. Reader response criticism explores the dialectic of text and reader. Some reader response critics pay more attention to the strategies of the text and some to the psychology of the reader. Let, let, me, let me repeat that. Some reader response critics pay more attention to the strategy of the text and some to the psychology of the reader. But when we are talking about rhetorical criticism, it focuses on the strategy of the text the strategies of the text. So this kind of criticism does not undertake an historic, historical quest to discover the actual reader of a text at any particular period and how they understood that text, but is concerned with implied reader defined by the strategies employed. So the concern is about the implied reader 
as defined by the strategies employed. Now, let's look at the implied reader. Who is an implied reader? Or who's an actual reader? Let's look at implied reader versus actual reader. Let's first look at implied reader. According to a literary critic, Wolfgang Eiser, an implied reader is an hypothetical figure who is likely to get most of what the author intended. They always have a better understanding of the text. An implied reader is someone who can understand what the author has written and also is able to understand the complexity of things, such as the metaphors which are used by the author in their books or articles. So the implied reader is also someone who is able to create text by himself. So now when we are talking about the actual reader, it's actually talking about some of us, especially with this in this class. Talking about some of us in this class. Praise God. So let's let's look at the actual reader here. According to Isa, the actual reader is someone who has a problem trying to get through a book and is unable to, or struggle to understand the complexity of things, such as metaphors which the author has used within their piece of writing. Actual reader also receive mental images while reading. But in the end, these images will just be replaced by existing stock of the actual reader's experiences. So as we are reading, you are capturing the images of what you've read. But before you know it, those images just disappeared because they are replaced by the existing stock of images that you already have in your mind. What does that mean? That means what you just read, it just captured, but it didn't settle. It didn't, it, didn't reg it didn't register in our minds. So now, let's, let me go personally a little bit. So at the, in, with this textbook and in this class, how will you, uh, where will you place yourself? Or what will you call yourself, an implied reader or actual reader? So uh, we'd like to see your response. So actual reader, because it's more realistic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's being realistic. So somebody else, are you an implied reader or actual reader? Okay. No, let me see right here. See, actual reader. Okay. Okay. But one thing, though, like we discussed last time, yes, actual reader, but when you read something, over and over and over again. For example, like the example we give here. Mm. Not cluster, not ideological. I'm trying to. Okay, it's a pentadic rhetoric, rhetoric criticism. It looks at the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the speech or text in the other world. This type of criticism examines the agent, accent, purpose, and agency. Okay. Okay. Is it? An implied reader is someone who can understand what the author has written and also is able to understand the complexity of things such as the metaphor, which are used by the author in their books or article. The implied reader is also someone who is able to create text by himself. Hmm. The actual reader 
also receive mental images while reading, but in the end, these images will be replaced by the existing stock of the actual reader experiences. So what I will suggest, people of God, is why don't we find a way to enjoy this class? Let's find, let's, let's find a way, because what you enjoy, you don't forget. <laughs> Sister Desmond is laughing. Huh? <laughs> One thing is that we are almost we are almost at the end of it, but I don't want us to just go through it. Because if you will go through it as actual reader, the moment we finish the class, yes, you will pass the test. You will pass the class. But believe me, you will just forget. And you don't want that. You don't want that. You say. I gave us one idea last time as we're studying it. Why don't we use all those scholars to study? Focus on the scholars, focus on what they say. Like today's scholar that we're going to focus on is Robert Fowler and the one I mentioned earlier on, Isa. When we remember those names, then you will remember what they say or what they wrote. So by that, you won't forget. So whenever I'm having trouble with a class, that's what I always do. I focus on, on all these uh, scholars. Okay, what does this one say? What does this one say? Even sometimes I will create an acronym <laughs> to remember so when I remember this acronym, I said this A means that is A for apple, B for boy, C for cat. <laughs> I create an acronym around that particular chapter. So whenever I'm trying to remember, when I remember the acronym, I will remember the whole thing. So by that, it will get to a point you don't need the acronym anymore because it registered in your mind. But it may take a minute because you're having a problem with the class. But when you get yourself familiar with it, then you remember. And before you know it, before you say two, three, four, five sentences, you are making a reference, you are referring to that class. So that tells you now that it has registered in your subconscious mind. So we need that. Praise God. Not only for because the class, as we are studying this class, the same method is applicable to every book in the Bible. Because it's not only synoptic that we should investigate. We should investigate every book of the Bible. How was it written? Who wrote it? Where did they get the information? So all these things we need to know as Bible students. We are no longer just a lay member in the church. You have joined a group of Bible scholars. And as a Bible scholar, we need to know all this information. Praise God. All right. So let's look at this, uh, this guy, this scholar called Robert M. Fowler's. Robert Fowler wrote a dissertation. And the title of this dissertation is Loaves and Fishes, the Function of the Feeding Stories in the Gospel of Mark. Loaves and Fishes, the Function of the Feeding Stories in the Gospel of Mark. The dissertation made a detailed study of the two feeding miracles in Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44, and Mark 8, verses 1 to 10. When you look in your textbook, it says it begins by using the method of reduction criticism and demonstrate that the paucity of Mark and characteristic in the story of the feeding of the 4,000 that is in chapter 8, verses 1 to 10, indicates the use of a Primacan tradition with a reduction and introduction and conclusion. On the other end, the instance of, of Macan 
uh, style and the feeding of 5,000, that is in chapter 6, verses 30 to 44, suggests that it is a Macan composition and the integral part, the pericle plays in the Macan narrative of chapters eight, 6 to 8 confirms the suggestion. But this is the thing, this is the irony. When we look, when we look at these two miracles, now, when Jesus wanted to perform another miracle and the disciples didn't believe, that caught Jesus by surprise. Wait, are you serious now? Because if I was there, that's what I would say. Wait, are you serious? Have you forgotten the miracle of this? How many bread did you guys have? They say, uh, five. How many people were we able to feed? They say, uh, 5,000. What about the other one? How many loaves of bread do you have? Uh, seven. How many were we able to feed? 4,000. And you still don't believe we can do this? But that's one thing that this guy wrote in his dissertation, though. So when I, when, when I was starting, when I get to that point, I say, are you serious now? <laughs> he called the disciples... He said they are dense and stupid. <laughs> I disagree with that. I disagree with that. What I would say is they are still babies in faith. They are still babies in the Lord. Though they are all grown, they are, all of them beside James and John, they are older than Jesus himself. But when it comes to their level of faith, they are still babies. They are still babies. So, look at Jesus' response. Look at Jesus' response. Say, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take? Did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven, for, for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? So the recognition of the interplay of the two episodes in the Macan story leads Fowler to exp express dissatisfaction with a reduction criticism, which defines the work of the redactor only, only in relation to the same summaries and insertion into traditional materials. <clears throat> but it does not belittle the usefulness of the distinction between reduction and tradition, but he affirms that the tradition has become an integral part of the final reduction, making a holistic reading essential. Exactly. Why don't you read the whole thing? Just read the whole thing. Praise God. All right. Outlet. The importance of reading one feeding miracle in the light of another prompts Fowler to consider other doubtlets in the Macan narrative. He noticed resemblance among these doublets. There is dual element in three of them. Number one, a coming of both wind and sea. That is Mark chapter four, verses 35 to 41. A banquet of bread and fish. Mark chapter six, Verses 30 to 44. A healing of a man who is deaf and mute. That's Mark chapter 7, verses 31 to 37. He continues to say, is in the other three stories, a single element dominates. If we want to compare it, it's a single element dominates. Jesus walking on the sea. Then the emphasis on the bread and the healing of the of the healing of blindness. That is eight verses twenty two to twenty six. Mm. 
right here. So a link is made between the two sea stories by the mention of the wind in each. Because we have two sea stories, but there's a link there. The first draw attention to the obtuseness of the disciples who fail to recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, even when faced with his control of wind and sea. Their final question, who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? Therefore operate on two levels. It recalls the blindness of the disciples, but also remind the reader of what had already been declared in the opening verse of the gospel that Jesus is the Messiah. You see, the thing is, if we read that today, we could see better than what the disciples saw then. We could see better than that. What the disciples didn't see, we can see it. Praise God. Before, before I continue, is there anyone still with me or you are lost? Are you still with me? We're with me? Okay. Because with this class, I would like to check almost every five, 10 minutes to make sure we are good. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's look at the reliable narrator and the irony. He said, it becomes clear as Fowler's studies develops that an adequate consideration of any individual story in the Gospel of Mark must reckon seriously with its contents and function within the old Gospel. Within the old Gospel. As reduction criticism has already demonstrated. So the recognition Praise God. The recognition that the individual statement can operate on more than one level, both within the story and for the reader, raises the general problem of how a text can make its ironical significance known to the reader. Known to the reader. Mm. Fowler continued to say, he said, this is the subject, I mean, the text, the textbooks continue to say, this is the subject of Fowler's final chapter, where it takes an ex exploratory excursion along the path towards the rhetorical criticism of the old gospel by providing a list of ways in which the text communicates a perspective to the reader from which to understand the significance of the event described, or as he explained, we will know the way in which the author furnishes a stable, reliable store of knowledge for the reader. Just the kind of knowledge over against which an author may construct stable, covert ironies. When we get towards the end, we will realize that this guy, this Fowler guy, we start saying something else that contradicts what he thought said. So that's one of the reasons why we studied this, to compare what they said, what he just said right here. When we get to a point, you realize that, okay, isn't that the same guy that first said something earlier on? Praise God. Let's continue. Let's look at author, implied author, and narrator. What's the difference between these three people, the author, and the implied author, and the narrator? The actual author is the person whom information is required apart from the text itself. The implied author is the person who is the author implied by the particular text. The narrator is the person who relates the narrative. In the case of Mark, 
The narrator never addresses the implied reader in the first person to give information about himself. He serves merely as the spokesman of the implied author. Let me give us an example. Let me give us an example of uh, the narrator. You say, we all remember when Jesus was right there in River Jordan, immediately after the baptism, as he came out of the water, as a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? We, we, we have you noticed that that's the narrator speaking right there? on behalf of God. <laughs> it says, and Jesus came out of the water and a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's a narrator speaking. That is not God. God had spoken, but somebody was narrating their story, telling us what happened. Praise God. So narrator merely serve as the spokesperson for the implied author. Praise God. Okay. Let's look at reliable information. Fowler lists some ways in which reliable knowledge is communicated to the implied reader. Number one the narrator's direct comment. A kind of collusive contact is made with the implied reader by the narrator's direct comment. So direct address is contained in the title and epigraph to the gospel. The title is a major clue to the reader about what to expect in the text. You see, that's the reason why I, I'm not sure if your Bible Wherever the printer of your Bible, there's some printer of the Bible today, they actually using this. Before you start reading a particular context, they will put a title there to let you know what you are about to read. You have a Bible like that, right? Yes. So when you see the title that will tell you this context, this is what it's, it's all about. So that is uh, direct comment narrator's direct comment so let you know because the direct address that is contained in the title and epigraph of the gospel not only the gospel in the entire bible so it will tell you what is going to happen next what is going to happen next all right then another one is linking statements some of the direct comment to the implied reader Fowler calls Lincoln's statement. For example, at the end of the account of Jesus walking on the water, a link is made with the preceding feeding miracle by the narrator's explanation. By the narrator's explanation. There was a link right there between these two miracles, between the miracle of walking on the water and the miracle of feeding the thousands. There's a link right there. Praise God. All right. The, the next one is explanation. Many direct remarks of narrator to implied reader are found in parenthetical construction which explain a fact or detail. All right. The omniscient narrator. Since the narrative provides information about the inner emotion, desires, thoughts, intentions, and perception of character, the narrator is omniscient. Hmm. It does not have to rely on action to judge motivation. It knows precisely why people do things. It knows precisely why people do things. But at the same time, don't forget that this is not God speaking. This is a narrator, but he's speaking for, for God. He's telling us the story. He's telling us what the implied author has written. 
or what the implied character has acted upon. Hmm. Okay. Let's look at reliable character. Reliable character. Since the narrator's point of view coincides with Jesus or with God's, the reliability of each is reinforced. Is reinforced. Let's 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 read those parties. I I, I make a example of one a few minutes ago. Let's check what those passages says. Let's look at uh, first. Let's look at Mark chapter one, verse eleven. Mark one eleven. And there came a voice from heaven saying. Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. In whom I am well pleased. So the narrator point of view coincide with God's point of view right here, because it's God speaking, and narrator is narrating the story. Narrating the story. Let's look at 9 verse 7. Mark 9, 7. See, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Hear him. But let's look at where he was narrating Jesus' word now. The book of Mark, chapter 2, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sin be forgiven thee. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Don't forget that it's not the narrator that is saying this. This is Jesus' word. If you have King James Version, you will see it's written in red ink. But it is the narrator that is speaking for or trying to explain it or trying to tell us to narrate the story of what happened, what Jesus did. The same thing in verse 8. The same thing in verse 8. See, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they saw reason within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? So again, this is Jesus speaking here. So, since the narrator's point of view coincided with Jesus and with God's, the reliability of each is reinforced. Reinforced. All right. Preliminary assessment of Fowler's categories. Fowler began his chapter by asking how the author of the Gospel of Mark furnishes the reader with a stable, reliable store of knowledge over against which irony can be recognized. Like we just read it. We just read I was just telling us this. All these details turned in one direction. They established the trustworthiness of the narrator. But... Fowler's original statement of his purpose is therefore misleading. Therefore misleading. Let's let's go into our let's go into our textbook. Come with me to uh, page two forty eight. Page two forty eight. It says Fowler began his chapter by asking how the author of the Gospel of Mark furnishes the reader with a stable, reliable store of knowledge over against which irony can be recognized. He has mentioned the following rhetorical devices. Number one, the general coherence of the presentation of norms. Two, the statements directly addressed to the reader which are elucidated in the Gospel. Three, the remarks which links different incidents. Four, the explanation of strange customs, terminology, and other facts important for understanding. Five, the statement which draw attention to momentous issue. Six, the omniscience of the narrator. And seven, the introduction of reliable characters to reinforce the message. All these details turned in one direction. 
They establish the trustworthiness of the narrator. Fowler's original statement of his purpose is therefore misleading. He had promised, this is the promise, we will note the ways in which the author furnishes a stable, reliable store of knowledge for the reader. Just the kind of knowledge over against which an author may construct stable, covert ironies. The gospel does furnish the implied reader with a stable, reliable store of knowledge for the recognition of irony, but it does so, first of all, by establishing the reliability of the narrator. Once this is achieved, everything that the narrator tells the implied reader can be accepted as true and its significance appreciated. By phrasing the statement as it does, Fowler confuses two topics. First, the establishment of the narrator's veracity, and second, on the basis of this, the ways in which the narrator gives information to, to the reader, to the reader. So he confuses these two topics. So as we read, please, that's why I say when we read, let's study what each scholars, what they are saying, what they are saying. Because if we just take what they say as if it is true, then the purpose of synoptic gospel is being defeated. Because what we are doing here is to investigate, to investigate. After the investigation, what do we do? We find out the truth. We find out the truth. But if you don't spend enough time to investigate, we will never find out the truth. Praise God. Now, the ass assessment of Fowler's study. Fowler's sketch of how it is that irony can be perceived by implied readers of the Gospel of Mark is useful beginning and demonstrates the potential of rhetorical criticism. So it is, it is, how can I put this? The sketch of how it is that irony can be perceived by implied reader of the gospel is just a useful beginning. And it demonstrates the potential of rhetorical criticism. It's just a useful beginning. So rhetorical criticism is one of those areas of New Testament studies which can benefit from the expertise of other literary critics. I wish we have more time. I will, have make, I will have made references to other literary critics that are actually not in our textbook for us to have a better understanding. But we don't want to propose, uh, postpone these classes because of the fasting that is going on, or else we will not be able to meet our time. We will not be able to finish on time, or we will not be able to finish our textbook. But please, Please, like somebody said uh, in the beginning, that is very technical. That is true, but spend time to read. You know, in class, we only have uh, less than an hour sometimes, sometimes an hour, sometimes a little more. But it is your responsibility to read. Please spend time to read. And if you have any question, let's ask it in class or send me an email with your questions and I will respond to that email. It is well. So, the implied reader, since Fowler's reading is restricted to the rhetoric of the gospel, it does not go on explicitly to define the implied reader. The reader inscribed by the strategy of the text as reader response critics do. So that's why, in the beginning, if you notice, I spent time to have what we don't have in the textbook. 
That is the implied reader versus actual reader. We don't have it in our textbook. So, because Fowler, it does not define the implied reader. No. And we need to know, that's why we spend time to, in the beginning, to actually understand the implied reader and the actual reader. So what's the difference? That's when we realize that, oh, I'm actually a natural reader, not an implied reader. Praise God. And if we look at it in our textbook as well, the definition of rhetorical criticism is very limited. So that's why I went um, out of the way to explain to us what is uh, rhetorical criticism and what are the methods of rhetorical criticism. So if you need, what, this is what I will do. After the class tonight, by God's grace, I will email this presentation, this PowerPoint, to everyone. So you will have it, because we don't have that in our textbook. Praise God. So, and that will be it for today. That will be it for today. So is there any question here before we start getting ready for today's service? Amen. Is there any question here? Okay. If there is no question for our next class, let's read chapter 17 and 18. Possibly we'll be able to cover both chapters. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. I will ask him. Uh, you just gave him a new name. <laughs> there is no A. It's just Tunde. There's no A. It's T-U-N-D-E. God bless you. So I, I will ask him to send it over. Oh, it's a typo. Okay. God bless you. So is there any other question or anything before we go again uh we're reading chapters 17 and 18 i know we already read chapter 17 then let's read chapter 18 along but if i were you i will read it again 17 and 18 for next week class and don't forget that our the text is due when? Today or tomorrow? Is is due today? Today. Today. Okay. Please, if you have not have I've received from some, but I haven't received from all. If you have not received yours, please send it over. If I receive it after midnight tonight there will be some deduction for late submission. So, God bless you. Let us pray. And don't forget to join at 6 o'clock. Our Father, we bless your name. We thank you for this moment that you have given us to spend in your presence, to study at your feet. Holy Spirit, we pray that you expand your word in our mind, our heart. Give us the spirit of understanding. Father, help us to know what you want us to know. Help us to see what you want us to see. We don't just want to go through this class and just pass it and forget about it. We want to benefit from it. Give us the spirit of understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. And tonight's service, Holy Spirit, have your way. Do what only you can do. Let there be open heavens. Let your fire fall. Let your presence be felt. Let your glory fill the house in the name of Jesus Christ. Let, let everyone be touched, O God, and transformed all to the glory of your name. So at the end, you take all the glory to yourself. Thank you, ancient of days. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 
God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.